You know, the, I guess the, the first and most obvious question somebody will ask you when you write a book about how to run a government. So, tell us, which is the best run government in the world? Um, I think I, I've been... Are so, you allowed to say Singapore? It's okay. Yeah, no, no. no so, uh, well, of the governments that um, I give a serious attention to in the book, I would say um, that Ontario and Canada has been very well run over a long period of time, that Dalton McGuinty was a very good Premier of Ontario for 10 years. His successor, Kathleen Wynne, is doing a, a, a nice job. Um, Maryland in the United States uh, was very well run under the eight years of the Governor Martin O'Malley, who just finished in January used data very well, cleaned up Chesapeake Bay, reduced the number of uh, uh, deaths in the state, violent deaths in the state by a lot, uh, one of the best school systems in the US, mm. um, used data excellently, had a delivery unit, um, had a great political language for explaining all that. Um, I don't want to be uh, on one side of politics, so Mitch Daniels, the Republican governor of Indiana, did a wonderful job for eight years between 2004 and 2012 took Indiana through a financial crisis, left its services in good order, inherited a deficit, and left a surplus. Mm -hmm. So that, that's three in the, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, uh, Singapore, uh, you, you all know more, more about than I do. I'd like, just like to put a word, because nobody has a good word generally for Pakistan. Uh, Shabazz Sharif has, won, or has run Punjab extremely well over the last few years. Real progress on education. Lahore is a fantastic city. Obviously, there are security challenges in that country, but there's a man with real vision in very difficult circumstances making significant progress. Um, and then um, in Europe, I would point to uh, the Netherlands, uh, Norway, as examples of well-run countries. Mm. And you wouldn't include China anywhere on the list? Well, uh, no, I, I think you know, China is really well-run, and I, I, want, I think you know, being self-critical, my book doesn't really deal with China because I just don't know enough. Um, and obviously that what, what's happened in China since the early 1980s is one of the most dramatic changes in human history in economic development terms mm. and clearly the government has got an awful lot right in doing that. So the reason I'm not mentioning China is, is, is my ignorance, nothing to do with China. Mm. I know you, 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 you should comment because <laughs> you know it very well and you've just been giving a lecture in the US on the subject. Yes, right. Well, another question, which is sort of, you know, recently when you mentioned uh, Obamacare and about the failure in the implementation, but of course there was also a failure of understanding uh, of what governments do because, I mean, one of the most famous uh, posters uh, was the lady carrying a sign saying, get the government out of my Medicare. Right. <laughs> Now, if you get the government out of Medicare, there's no Medicare. <laughs> no. So how, how, do you, how do you explain the fact that you have, on the one hand, the United States, the, probably one of the world's freest presses, the, the world's most sophisticated news organizations, and this amazing ignorance about the role of government? Yeah. How do you explain the paradox? Well, um, American history is something I've studied um, extensively, and indeed I've specialized in over a long period of time, and I think the... Um, the, the, the sort of big story of American history in, my, in one sentence is they set some ideals back in 1776 um, and it's the struggle between the reality and achieving those ideals and mm. they narrow the gap towards the ideals sometimes and then they get distant and right now we're in a phase of the gap between the ideals uh, and the reality being quite distant. Why? Why is that? Why, so why, why is the gap grown, gap grown bigger? I, I think because um, you know, I mean, it's, it's a complicated thing, but the biggest problem is the extent to which money is driving um, electoral politics. Mm -hmm. And um, a, a relatively small number of very big influential groups or uh, individuals are having far too big a shaping effect for anybody who's a Democrat to feel comfortable. And then this whole Obamacare thing has been controversial. Now, the other thing that's a theme in American history is a skepticism about government. They built that into the Constitution. Mm -hmm. The, origin, the, origin, the founders of America were deeply skeptical about government. They always believed in uh, liberty versus government. Uh, and uh, when government uh, goes through a period of, uh, of being frustrating, you get a kind of outcry against it. And the Tea Party, mm. represented by your banner, uh, mm. is that's a cry of outrage from pretty, um, to put it bluntly, an ignorant group of people who are frustrated by the way things are working out. It's a howl of rage. Um, and as you say, Medicare is government funded. Uh, and if government got out of it, mm. I mean, it just on healthcare, interestingly, 
America spends somewhere around 18% of GDP on healthcare, uh, of which about 8 or 9% is public money. Britain spends about 9% of GDP, 8 or 9% on healthcare, all of which is public money. So interestingly, America, which criticizes, or certainly that strand of American politics, which criticizes Britain for having socialist healthcare, uh, actually spends as much on socialist healthcare as Britain does. And so there's a whole set of contradictions tied up in that. Mm. Okay, great. Now we can throw the floor open for questions. I hope someone will think of a difficult question for Michael. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, my name is Donald. I'm a member of the faculty at LKY School. Uh, we met in 2003 when I visited uh, PMDU. Right. Uh, so it's great to see, uh, connect again. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the importance of routines because routines is probably so important but often underestimated. And no governments can function effectively without well-established, well-rehearsed, well-thought-through uh, routines, repertoires, rules and processes. Uh, but what happens when those routines are no longer appropriate for the context? New problems emerge, the context changes, uh, and governments tend to be very slow at changing routines. Now, when routines are like individual habits, right? What's habits to individuals? It's routines for governments, so for, for large organizations. And particularly for successful governments or successful organizations, uh, the context can change much faster than that organization is able to revamp or reinvent itself uh, in as far as routines and processes go. So what, what advice have you got for those, yeah. those governments? No, it's a nice question, Donald. Thank you very much. And uh, I, th I think the, I mean, there's some, some routine or some um, practices in bureaucracies become sclerotic and get in the way of change. But the kind of routines I'm talking about aren't like that. I'm, I'm arguing for routines where the, the, the key people involved in a change are constantly rev seeing the data and checking whether this is working. So in in my understanding, or the routines I'm recommending, the changes in the wider environment, you would notice sooner than if you didn't have the routines, and you would be able to adapt and refine. If you've got good information coming into the system, and that's about data, but it's also about being in touch with the front line, knowing and understanding what people are thinking. And um, we found the routines, not just the briefing of Blair through monthly notes, but the stock takes where we reviewed pro pro progress, uh, were really important and obviously ministers and prime ministers have been meeting for hundreds of years in Downing Street but the difference was they're now looking at the data is it working or not I remember this moment of triumph uh, just in my own head when there was a debate I put some health data on a PowerPoint screen in the cabinet room and uh, the Alan Milburn the health secretary is in the room and uh, Blair is on the other side of the table and Blair looks at the graph and he says that looks like a trajectory uh, sorry that looks like like a plateau to me Alan you know, your trajectory is plateauing out. So Blair has kind of learnt the language of, uh, uh, of data and then we do something about it. So if you get the routines right and they're fresh and they're focused on their data, the data will change all the time and, it, and you will anticipate crises and prevent them. Um, the, the thing I'm really, what I worry about with governments is when you get a big crisis and it just blows everything out of the water. I remember going to Pakistan just after that flood a few years ago uh, I was trying to do education reform. There were about 45 people came to a meeting, senior officials from around Pakistan on education. The flood has been very, very traumatic, it covered more than the size of England. Thousands of people have died. Um, and basically what these people said is, we've had a flood, we can't do education reform anymore. And you can kind of understand, it's very traumatic. But I, I decided not to be understanding, I decided to be, I guess you'd call it ruthless. So what I said was, did the flood make your schools better? And then there was a silence, a bit like that, actually. Um, and you've got, to, you've got to, government has to deal with the crisis, but not let it overthrow the entire agenda. And that's what a delivery unit can do for you. Hello, Sir Michael. Um, my name is Bini. I'm from National Healthcare Group, and we've had the great privilege of my eating Sir Michael today over lunch. Uh, my question today um, is that, you know, in some circles, government is a dirty word because it's, you know, dichotomous. Di government and autonomy seem to be dichotomous. Now, what I want to ask you is, is it necessarily so? Does it have to be so? And um, how do we resolve this? How do we change people's minds regarding this? Or 
if government and autonomy cannot coexist, then how do we find a find how do we find the balance? Thank you. Well, I, I think actually you, you raise a, a, a real a genuine dilemma here, and, and to what, the way I would put it is, governments and, and autonomy should be should go together. They shouldn't be a dichotomy. Um, and as I was saying earlier, government actually is the best, and in some circumstances, the only guarantor of individual liberty. Um, uh, and so that's one form of autonomy. Uh, but then autonomy for organisations. Um, but but that, that's a point that most people don't get, right? They assume that to get liberty, you have to some other chip away at government. Yeah. And, and that, that's the traditional conception of liberty. Yes, that's true. But, but actually, liber, li, you know, liber, liberty is... Um, um, it, 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 liberty is a construct of government in the end. In the mm. end, governments, you know, sometimes after revolution or violence or whatever, governments create the circumstances in which individuals have liberty. Now, you do have to guard against the constant potential of government to encroach on liberty, mm. whether it's through... Um, uh, spying or uh, data mm. systems or um, breaches of uh, privacy and so on, but the but but I, uh, and you only have to look around the world now. Without government, there's no liberty. Um, mm. So government is a is a generator of liberty. And then for organisations, for business organisations, uh, which want autonomy to get on and uh, succeed or fail in the marketplace, again, the market has to be guaranteed. There needs to be a regulator of an energy market. Uh, uh, a financial market, even a retail market, you know, weights and measures and um, the, the food cleanliness. The, the, you know, there was a great moment in American history where they, in 1908, the Pure Food and Drugs Act was passed to stop the various abuses of industrial America in the, um, uh, all of those. So, so again, the autonomy of business organizations depends on government. It also depends on limiting government and that's the tension that you're drawing attention to. And then finally, I just want to say, any organisation that gets public money, which would clearly include, include your own, if you, 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 a government might want to give autonomy or a degree of autonomy to public organisations, a school or a national healthcare group, uh, but they're spending taxpayers' money and they have to account to the taxpayer for the money, so it can't be a pure autonomy. They do need to see that the public money has been spent uh, honourably and wisely and they do need to see an outcome, a set of results for that money. So you'll never get pure autonomy where government money is going, and nor should you. Sure, Zeker van der Waal, faculty member here at, at the yes, school. We met last year, yeah. We, we met last year. Um, I'm very happy, by the way, you mentioned the Netherlands as a hallmark of good governance. So always good to hear, kind of refreshing these days. Um, I wanted to sort of follow up on, on Donald's question. Um, I haven't read the book yet, but it seems to focus a lot on sort of structures, processes, um, rituals, etc. How about people, right? So, so we're training a lot of future public servants, public managers here at the school. What kind of skills, capabilities would public managers need to become good deliverologers? Yeah. And can, I, can I add to that question? Because I also noticed the same thing, that I thought you would have a chapter on how to get the best people into government. Right. And I think mean, I mean, there's no chapter here on how to get, I mean, if you can't get good people into government, how do you get good government? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and uh, uh, maybe I should uh, write a chapter on that. But, but, the, but there's quite a lot in there when you read it about, about people and training and developing them, inspiring them, the kind of leadership a delivery unit needs. There's a whole section on um, how you change skills, attitudes, and capacity in public workforces in the irreversibility chapter. So there's quite a lot in there. Mm. There's a lot about how you... Uh, interact with the public, how you deal with um, conflict with with unions and negotiation and all that, which is a very big theme in in lots of in lots of governments. So, I think that I think the um, the theme that you're raising is is in there. Whether it's enough, you will tell me. But but it's it's not a separate chapter. But but yeah, it, this is really important. I think um, we were talking about this prior to to this session. Um, the thing we've got to get across, those of us that believe in public policy and successful government. To, uh, particularly to, to young aspirant people, is you, there's no place in um, the world better than government to make a big difference to people's lives. The opportunity to change people's lives is better. You know, if, if you want, if, if you're, 
leaving university or deciding where to go in a career and your big goal is to change people's lives, doing it through government is the best possible, the most inspiring possible way. There will be frustrations on the way. It will be often intense. Sometimes things will go wrong. Sometimes you'll get battered. That's part of that's modern life. But if you want to change people's lives, it's very inspiring. And the skills are becoming more and more clear. Um, uh, uh, my colleagues, two of whom are sitting over here, uh, and I are working on looking at developing programs for the training of civil servants that would be that would transcend national boundaries that aren't about a one-week program or a master's program they're about continuous learning online learning related to on-the-job learning giving people tasks to do in their role giving them mentorship uh, as well as uh, regular three or four day programs of interaction I think there's a huge opportunity not just to attract more people into government, government is back as mm. you were saying, but also to make sure that once they get into government they have fulfilling careers. You meet far too many civil servants, I'm not, I'm not talking about Singapore now, who come in with a real aspiration to make a difference and then get ground down by boring processes, deeply old fashioned hierarchies uh, and lack of inspiration. So they become cynical but they started off inspired. Yeah, Sir Michael, Peter Tesh is my name. I'm with the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, actually attending a senior management program here at the school uh, this month. Uh, I'd be interested, again, I've only seen what you've put up on the screen. I'd be interested in your observations about the role of social media in governing. Um, it's both a source of contestation of authority, but it's a useful enabler, eliciting data, delivering services. So in your experience, um, particularly given what's happened in the social media space since you were in the PMDU, um, are there any broad observations you could make? And is there anybody in the world who's getting that right in terms of using social media in the business of governing? And I say this as somebody who's never tweeted in his life. Right. Um, I, think, I think the answer is Prime Minister Modi. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, I'd, I'd love to hear your views on this, Kishore, and I think you should chip in because you, you, yeah. you in, in many of these aspects, you know uh, more than I will ever know. But the, um, uh, oddly, I think it's a really important question, and it was an interesting um, phrase in your, um, the way you put the question is, in your experience. And if you think about it, none of us have had experience of social media for more than 10 years. So, it, like, we're all, it's so new, we don't really, I mean, the, the Twitter and Facebook didn't exist when I was in the PMDU and I left in 2005 um, and so we're still learning how to do this and as it happens I was in Melbourne yesterday um, with a group of leaders of the American uh, of the Australian Public Service and we had a whole discussion about that theme um, and I think you know there's, there's some things you can say in answer to a question but they're hard to do one is that the era of governments making announcements is effectively over. Uh, we're now in a phase of governments joining conversations. And you have to shape people through being part of a conversation. I know in Singapore you've had the whole phrase about a Singapore conversation. How you do that is really important. And it changes the political skill set in a significant way. Too many politicians, you completely understandably find it hard to raise the very difficult issues and get in debate with them. But unless they can find a language, you're going to get this air of unreality where there's a, a political language uh, that is safe and problems like Medicare and Medicaid are getting left off the agenda. Or actually, I think successive French leaders have failed to engage with globalization, just to give an example. If, the leader, if leaders fail to engage with the major issues of the day, in the end you get this divorce of what government is doing from what people can see needs doing and that does lead to cynicism. So we're going to have to get better at all of this, but I, I don't have the answers. I think you can't avoid it, so you have to engage with it, but exactly how you do that and, uh, uh, and what the benefits are, I'm not sure. I do also think, by the way, that the power to collect data is something that is very, very, and you mentioned it, is very powerful. My name is Chi Xiang, uh, and I'm going to start university like this year in August. So I kind of have two questions to ask you, Sir Michael. Uh, the first question is with regards to the idea of government like business. Like, I think a lot of the ideas that you brought up seems a bit more at home. It seems to have some form of like corporate style sign type of language, seems to be something at home in the corporate world. So with regards to this idea that's been bending about in policy circles every now and then, uh, what's your view about the idea of running a government like a business? And the second question is with regards to 
the progressive nature of some of these policies. Uh, while some of these policies are probably very interesting in the way that they actually try to go and change the ways that governments run, uh, at the same time, we also notice that in many instances, many civil services tend to run on very uh, conservative lines. Like they have certain inherent practices that they've been doing for the longest time and they may not be so willing to change. So how exactly does an elected body of politicians try to convince the civil service to accept some of these more progressive means of policy making in order to execute some of the policies more easily? Thank you. I think often progressive change does come originate with politicians rather than in the, in the civil service. Uh, often I think that is the case. And the big moments in uh, uh, changing, you know, if you take, to take American history, the, the New Deal came from a political drive to try and solve some very challenging um, economic and social circumstances. Um, just, to, just to give one example off the top of my head, or um, for, from a different angle, the, the transformation of Britain in the early Thatcher era was a progressive, in one sense, depending on how you define the word, reaction to the way Britain had turned out in the 1970s, and it wouldn't have happened for me in the government. It needed a courageous politician to take it on. Um, so that's the, the, I, I, think, I think the politics of getting progressive change, uh, step change, significant change, <coughs> is, is, is a really important part of this. On the first bit, I, I don't quite accept that analysis. So. Deliverology, or uh, the you know the trying to think through how to work in government, was born uh, in wrestling with the real world problems inside of government. Obviously, you should learn from what happens in the corporate world. And now I um, work in the corporate world, and what I find is the corporate world, um, first of all, is not necessarily better uh, at government than dealing with big complicated problems. And secondly, that um, that it's that the answers are simply like if you're in a business and you decide something is a distraction, you can just divest it or you can sell it or you can stop doing it. You can't do that in government. Um, the media intrusion. You, you, can, you can sell off a part of the country. <laughs> you can tell Scotland to leave. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you could, you could, you could. It's an extreme, it's an extreme reaction. Um, uh, and then um, I, I think you, you also need um, your, um, your indicators are clearer and simpler um, and the media intrusion is less. Uh, freedom of information legislation affects you less. There's a lot, of, there's a lot fewer pressures and the way forward is clearer. Um, and I think some of the best run businesses certainly have lessons for government. But I think what I'm arguing in there is absolutely about how to change things from within a government thinking through the lessons, whether you're in the developed world or the, or the developing world. James Crabtree, I write for the Financial Times. You touched on this, but I wanted to ask a little about the, um, the longevity of, of PMDU and some of the other units that were set up at that time. They don't exist in the same form now. Uh, the strategy unit, PMDU, various other of these units, when the political winds changed, they were replaced and other units were set up. There was a behavioral insight unit. You know, the, the new governments like to bring in their own central functions. So how, how, did, how reflecting upon that, how do you balance the, the sort of the, the, the juice you get from setting up a new individual unit for a particular function against the need to embed this function much more widely throughout the bureaucracy? And, and what advice would you have for people trying to do that in, in future? The unit is not the key thing here. Um, you, can, you can do effective delivery without having a delivery unit. It's the discipline of delivery, it's the setting of priorities, it's the collecting the data, it's the routines, it's the driving progress, it's the reviewing progress, it's solving problems as, you, as they come but, but up. You, but you need a change agent but though. You, but exactly, you need a change agent and the delivery unit was one of those change agents in the Blair administration. Um, and uh, so that, that helped, that, that, that was definitely a key part of it. But what happened over time is exactly as you say, um, it slightly lost its way in the Gordon Brown era where, where the country was totally dominated by the financial crisis. Um, David Cameron in opposition had a kind of rhetoric against targets and centralization, abolished it. Then um, some way into the first term, uh, his um, number 10 started talking to me about saying, we know we rubbished all that when we were in opposition, but how did you do that? Uh, 
They said, do you think we could do some of that and call it something different? I said, yes, they've set up an implementation unit. It's now powered up. David Cameron, in the run-up to the election, took that very, very seriously. And I think we'll see, uh, and probably he will regret the fact that he ever abolished it, we'll see an implementation unit being a significant player in the new Cameron administration. We'll wait and see. But the, my key point is the, the way of thinking, the delivery mindset is more important than the unit itself. Mm. Kishore is right, you need a change agent in any government and uh, that's the, the point about sclerotic bureaucracies and some, somebody has to be the change agent that challenges the norms and that is important and it can be a delivery and it's been like Pamandu in Malaysia just across the border has done a really nice job. Martin O'Malley had a delivery unit in Maryland of about three or four people did a fantastic job. So a group of people who are focused on implementation of the priorities is important. It doesn't have to be a delivery unit. Ontario, I mentioned earlier, they did for a brief while have a results office. It didn't really work. They got the wrong leadership. They did away with the results office, but they kept doing the delivery thinking and delivered extremely well. Mm. Next question, please. Yes. I'm Aaron from Tantok Singh Hospital. I'm just wondering if you have identified a priority that unfortunately spans beyond an election cycle. How do you negotiate the priority across uh, multiple election cycles? Yeah. Oh, it's very simple. Get rid of elections. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I, I was with um, a minister uh, one of the ministers in um, state government in Australia uh, recently, um, and uh, he's got a sort of big vision of what he wants to do. And the way we, we ended that conversation was say, well, he'd set a 10-year vision of how it could be different. So we, over 10 years, we'd like it to be like this. But in this particular state, they have a three or four-year election cycle. So you set out the 10-year vision, and then you say, so, and, you, and you communicate that publicly, and then you say, and you'll know we're on track after three or four years because you'll see these changes. And that, those will be the milestones on the way. And then in the election, you hope that momentum will carry, carry through. There are basically two ways of getting a reform through an election. One is you get re-elected and carry it on, which, is, which happened in the Blair administration with health and education. The second is you do it so well that even though the opposition wins for whatever reason, they take it on uh, and carry it on, which is what happened with the Blair education reforms when the conservative, well, conservative-led coalition came in in 2010, but didn't happen with the Blair health reforms. Uh, but that was because um, the, the coalition government made a mistake, in my view. So, but, but basically, you have to get enough progress within one election cycle for people to say, yeah, that's worth carrying on. Next question. And, and by the way, the whole chapter, chapter seven, is called Irreversibility, and it's all about that. And, and there's more to it mm. than, than I've just answered. Uh, hi, Michael. This is Vicky uh, from the Hong Kong ICAC. Uh, actually, I'm also attending the SMP uh, in uh, LKY school right now. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, I'm very interested in your book because, uh, the ti because of the title. Uh, because, uh, you know, follow, following the Occupy Central uh, last, ye uh, last year, you know, the Hong Kong cit citizens in are Hong going Kong. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, uh, well, we find that uh, the uh, Hong Kong government and uh, you know, the society uh, which are deadlocked. So rendering the you know, implementation of the policy very, very difficult especially the pan uh, Democrats you know, voted to engage in a full-scale uncooperative uncoop movement against the government. So what advice will you give uh, the, to the uh, you know, Hong Kong government officers to make their life easier? I, I should be honest about the limitations of the book. So my, my book is if you're a citizen interested in how government works or you're a newly elected government or a, you're a government and you want to get things done, this stuff will help you get it done. But there are some big questions of political science not addressed in the book, and one of them is about legitimacy. Um, and however well a government uh, tries to deliver or fails, if the population doesn't consider it to be legitimate, there are real, you know, a whole set of other wider, deeper questions come up. Um, for all I know, that might come up in the United Kingdom in the next four years. There's 53 out of the 57, or 55 out of the 57 MPs in Scotland are from the Scottish Nationalist Party. 
uh, maybe in two years they'll be saying, well, we don't recognize the legitimacy of the government in Westminster. The Scottish people didn't vote for any of the people who are making these decisions. So you, legitimacy can come up even in very well-established, long traditions uh, uh, as in the United Kingdom. And we'll see how that plays out. And I don't pretend my book answers that question. If I were in the government in Hong Kong or talking to them, I would say really work hard to think through and find out what the citizens of Hong Kong believe, think. Uh, talk to them about the challenges of the future, where Hong Kong is going in the future. Be in dialogue with them. Deliver in the meantime, deliver services really well. I mean, and Hong Kong has some, you know, some great schools, for example. Um, so keep doing that, but, but generate a new dialogue about what Hong Kong is going to be like in, like in the future. But I don't pretend that what I've said now or what's in the book answers the question about legitimacy. And I think some people in Hong Kong are skeptical on that for, the, for that reason. Hello, my name is Martin. I work at the school in the area of executive education. I like very much how you started with prioritization uh, in your presentation and your book. So I was wondering for uh, an educational institution like Elka High School, like other universities, uh, for teachers, faculty, for capacity builders, what do you think are the capacities and the teaching that you want to give emerging leaders or uh, current policymakers? What do you think are the capacities to teach that you would prioritize from the education perspective? Well, there's, there's, there's kind of attitudes and mindset and then there's skills. And I think um, a sense of the potential of government to change people's lives for the better and a sense of optimism that you can do this. These are really important. And um, in some civil services, I'm not talking about Hong, uh, Singapore here, I don't know enough, but in some civil services and in some academic institutions, um, skepticism or cynicism are kind of part of the culture and that that's you, obviously in an academic institution you want skepticism about ideas and, uh, and genuine debate but if you if in public policy programs you teach um, powerlessness or lack of ambition um, that's not going to be a good thing so a sense of belief in the moral purpose of government the potential of government to change people's lives, to make a difference, to make a society better, to, lead, to enable people to lead more full, full lives. So there's a set of attitudes there and a belief that you as a, a government official, whether elected or, 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 or a, a, an appointed official, you and a handful of people can make an enormous difference. And there are lots of examples where you know, five or six people working together make a huge difference in some government program. That's one thing. And then there are the skills of... Um, dialogue with people and uh, obviously I'm, I'm biased the skills of delivery how you get things done um, how you negotiate I, I think is really important that, uh, I, there's a whole section in here about how you deal with difficult people in difficult institutions learning that set of stuff is really vital content um, and then much more second order is the content of whichever department you might end up in uh, I would have a core program on public finance and how you manage public finances. And chapter eight is about that, it's called other people's money. Because governments only have taxpayers' money, which is today's um, citizens, or, or borrowing, which is tomorrow's citizens paying. So how you manage money, I think, is a really important part of it. Okay, maybe we'll take one last question, please. It's approaching 6.30, so we're gonna finish. Uh, good evening, sir, Michael. My name is Rohit. I have a visitor this evening. You briefly mentioned Pemandu in Malaysia, and uh, 2008, I think, Idris Jala was hired from Shell. He was the chief executive of Shell in Malaysia. Uh, now, Malaysia has been, in the last few years, only in the news for the wrong reasons. Can you share some best practices that Pemandu has achieved in the last uh, eight to ten years? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, exactly. And um, I, I was... Um, involved in the dialogue with Najib Razak and his cabinet when, when, they, when Najib Razak was new Prime Minister in, in setting up Pemando and then Idris was uh, recruited from, actually from Malaysia Airlines and prior to that Shell. Um, and he is a uh, very engaging, uh, rather brilliant uh, individual who's done a fantastic job. So they set, um, they set up a government transformation program with six priorities, um, such as rural basic infrastructure, urban public transport in KL, um, reducing poverty, improving education, uh, crime reduction, dealing with corruption, uh, and then later they added um, 
something on, on um, the standard of living, effectively, or the, the cost of living. Um, and on many of those, they've, ma they've made really good progress. Uh, for about three or four years, I was part of a panel that reviewed their progress annually. Um, then they, secondly, so that was one part of the Pomando agenda, and they, were, they did all the kind of things I talked about here. They had routines, they had data, they checked, they pursued things through. Then they uh, took on an economic transformation program. They picked, I think, 11 or 12 sectors of the economy, which included um, tourism, but didn't include car manufacturing, so, so that's been pushed to the sidelines. And if you look at the, um, the economic growth figures in Malaysia over the last few years, uh, the reduction of public debt, there's some real progress there. Now, so then the question is, how come um, the government gets in the news for all the wrong reasons? Well, you know, there've been that. There's the the way in which the uh, and this goes beyond what Pemanda is doing. There's the the relationship with the um, with the uh, opposition. Uh, the, th what people inside the government think is, without Pemandu, they wouldn't have even won the last election in the way that they did. Uh, then there've been a, a series of scandals, which I read about in the papers, but don't know any details about, which have which tarnish the leadership and one of the things I say in there using the example of Chile actually is you can get delivery right but it doesn't guarantee you popularity because if you get a lot of these other things wrong uh, you can be in the news for all kinds of things um, so I think Pamandu has actually done a really good job of improving the quality of life in Malaysia in the ways that I've described but on its own that doesn't solve all the problems that Malaysia faces and obviously one hopes that um, Malaysia will come through because it's an important country uh, to the region and the world. Well, I, you, I, I'm sure you'll all agree that we learned very many new things here. I must confess that even though I live in Singapore and Malaysia is next door, I didn't hear much about Pemandu. Right. <laughs> so it's good to hear that uh, there well, are parts one, of... One thing I should say um, uh, yeah. is, is that delivery units should generally keep out of the news and they should, they should do the oh. job, but do it in a cautious way and let the, minister, the relevant ministers take the credit for any successes. That, 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 that's actually very profound advice to all those of you who want to join any civil service or, or foreign service, uh, that you must always make sure that the ministers get all the credit. Yeah. But you do all the work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> make <exactly>. sure that, <laughs> exactly, yeah. And make sure at the end of the day the people are better off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I mean, it's a noble mission. I think, I mean, that, that at the end of the day, I think the, the good news about government being back is that people now realize that actually getting government right is very, very, very critical. And there was a kind of a tendency, tendency to be flipped about government, to, to deride it, to was popular, to sort of you know, be skeptical about it. Now I think we've got to change that culture of skepticism and treat it actually as a, one of the most serious enterprises that we have. In, in, in terms of human existence, and we yeah. should do something about making sure that governments run well. And I think in this regard, I think you'll all agree that Michael has done a great job. So let's join, please join me in thanking him. Thank you.